I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. As always, I am one of your hosts, Amy, and my co-host, of course, is... I'm Jason. And um, we have a guest today, which I was thinking about this. When we have guests, the reveal doesn't work for the video version of the podcast. So if you're watching the video, act surprised. Um, we do have a guest today, and I'm very excited um, to have this person joining us because he's one of my all-time favorite people in the world, um, Mr. Matt Wood. Hello, Matt, and welcome. Hi, everybody. All right. So, Amy, that's a great, great point. And either in the editing of the video we can not reveal the person. We'll like have them magically like dissolve in <laughs> or we'll like ask them to wear a bag over their head with a question mark. It'll be great. I could. I'm sort of liking the bag out. on that. Hey, I get the slide. <laughs> Back in. Nice. Just have them all, you know, the, the desk chairs that like lower with the hydraulic lift, just like have them. So it's like a chest shot, which would not work for ladies, but then just, oops, sorry, slowly slide into frame. That'd be good. That um, would be good. The possibilities are endless and yes. ridiculous. Yeah, a bag around here someplace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're good. You're revealed now, so we'll go with it. Um, so I feel like we should just tell people very quickly who Matt is so that we can start drinking and get into the nerdery. I like it. Um, so Matt, who are you and what are you doing here? Um, my name is Matt. Um, I'm a musician, an author, I guess. Is that right? Yes. Um, I'm a nerd. Um, and, uh, that's, that's kind of it. I also All these that. things. You're in the right place. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're definitely in the right place. Uh, Matt and I met, um, oddly because he was one of my early fans on Google plus of all places, like five years ago now. And then we were both at space fest, which is like the space nerd conference in Tucson. And I recognized him from just chatting online. Cause he's also a teacher and I love educators and when educators use my work. And then I met Matt and then he slowly revealed to me that he is in mini bosses, which is an eight bit Nintendo cover band. Um, That's so yeah. The tribute band. So, so as I've known Matt over the years, he's gotten weirder and weirder and more and more fitting for this show. So let's get into it. And that means we have to open the beer. Um, I have a weird one today. I have, what is this? This is the Ballast Point. I don't know if you can see that there. The Ballast Point Cinnamon Raisin Commodore American Stout. Whoa, that's I have complex. No, I know, right? I walked by that's it in amazing. the grocery store and I was like, I don't know if, I, I have no idea what this is going to be, but let's try it. Ballast so that's Point my beer is today. so fascinating with what they do. I really want to go meet those guys and talk beer I with know. them. I know. We got to get there at some yeah. point. Um, Jason, what are you drinking today? Oh, boy. Well, you know, I haven't gone gone big uh, so far <laughs> on the show. So I decided today that today's going to be big beer day for me. And this one's really big. This is a full uh, 32 ounces, a, a quart of beer. And this is from the fine folks at the Phoenix Ale Brewery. This is the Biltmore Blonde Ale in their giant crawler. And I can't say enough good things about these guys. Um, I just went there to, the, to their uh, tasting room and uh, brewery on my birthday and had a Groupon and got all sorts of awesome beerness with that Groupon, including flights, pints, crawlers and when they found out it was my birthday they gave me a free pint glass and some stickers and then one of the brewers like became our friend was buying us drinks so really awesome people there and it's an interesting place they have going because they're like two companies under one roof because um, Sonoran Brewing another brewery here uh, partnered up with them and decided to I guess um, Phoenix Phoenix Ale Brewery brews all Sonoran stuff, like in the same location. Oh. So it's two breweries housed in one place. Right. And you get down there. and Phoenix Ale was actually I didn't know this until recently, but uh, it was started by like a, a craft brew legend, a guy who used to own many years ago owned a Pyramid in Washington. Oh, so when he sold nice. Pyramid Brewing, he moved to Phoenix and uh, was convinced to open a brewery here and open Phoenix Ale Brewing. Hmm. So. 
Awesome. So, and this reminds me that I am the biggest bitch in the world because I knew it was your birthday, but I didn't know the date. I'm sorry I missed happy belated birthday. It's okay, Amy, <laughs> because let's see, this show, I believe, is, is uh, people listening and watching now are watching this in March. Right. So we're, we're many months yeah. removed. So we're okay. Yeah. But I will point out, Amy, <laughs> that uh, because a, a few episodes ago we recorded actually on Festivus, Phoenix Ale Brewery yeah. has a beer called Festivus. So. That's I've amazing. It. It's really good. It you is really good. have had it. Hmm? Um, what are you drinking now, Matt, is the real question. What am I drinking now? Yes. Okay. So I've got, I think you can see it, Death by Coconut by Oscar Blues. Nice. Ooh. It's nice. a nice nut brown. There's a little bit of coconut in it. It's a little roasted, and it just tastes really good. Excellent. Delicious. Awesome. Well, I feel like I've had that one. All right. Well, Matt cheated <laughs> and is already yeah. drinking. No, we didn't. We didn't tell you, but um, we're gonna let's let's start opening the beers. So there we go. Oh, All right. It's actually, tough to open this gigantic beer. <laughs> I, I I can't believe how massive that can is. It, it, it's actually it's, really yeah, funny. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's and that has bad. one of the giant. Does that have the giant sipping hole at the top? I forget what that's called. It actually doesn't. So. <laughs> so I feel like I should point out I do have a second beer here, so I'm not like you're not drinking five times the amount of the rest of us. We're all ready. Well, to it's pay, okay so. because you and our guests usually do that to me, so I'm making That's up true. today. Now, all right, I, cheers. All right, sounds good. Cheers, I'll guys. I have to go get another. All right. Cheers. I almost need two hands to drink this beer properly. Like, I feel it's gonna slip <laughs> out of my hand. I, I I know that feeling with my tiny hands. I. Yeah, the story I always tell is when I got the iPhone 6, I had to return it for the iPhone SE because I just kept dropping it because my hands were so small. This is an interesting beer. My <laughs> wife really wants right. to get the iPhone SE because she hates the big phones and because it doesn't fit in pockets or anything. Exactly. I'm 100% with her on that. I was so annoyed that it just kept like, I put bigger it in my back and pocket and, and I'd sit down and just be like, Pow. it's like, this is <laughs> not, this is not going to work. Yeah. Um, all right. So where do we want to start? The thing is, it's because Matt hits on like everything that we do. So I don't know. Do we want to start with? Let's probably I'm a start. Nerd, so let's probably start with music. Yeah. Because I feel like we're going to talk about so much more beyond that. There's, so. And there's so much space involved in this this trio right now too. So yeah, yeah. let's let's jump off with the music bit because that's um, yeah. Tell us. I don't know. I'm, I should like prepare questions and things, but tell us, um, mini bosses. For those of you who don't know what it is, tell us about the band and kind of what the genesis of that that uh, very interesting little uh, group was. Okay, uh, well we can we can go way back in time, I guess. So, mini bosses started out when I was in college back in Massachusetts with my friend Aaron and my other friend Ben, and we had a love of video games and. I think we started out as just doing some covers of like Nirvana stuff, you know, typical college band uh, house party stuff. And then we started working in little bits of Super Mario or Castlevania into songs that we really enjoyed. So it was kind of like we created these medleys that mixed all kinds of weird stuff together. And people at parties tended to... Um, I don't know, mostly enjoy it, but we really enjoyed it a lot. And we did that for about, I don't know, six months maybe. And we then decided, hey, we're going to record an album. So we put together a couple of songs that sounded really good to us anyway. Now I can't even listen to that first recording. <laughs> and we, um, we put out that album and then we all decided to move to Phoenix. Um, and this was like in 2000. And we did a little mini a mini bosses mini tour on the way out playing out of the back of a rider truck um got to meet a lot of really strange people uh and no one i think had ever heard us do this or heard anybody really play this kind of music kind of metally kind of punk rocky because there's no vocals we don't add any special effects to it um it's just guitars bass and drums and we play it kind of uh, as close as we can to the original but we do make it a little bit kind of punk rock i guess um, and then we got out here and, uh, we went from there. We just started playing locally and then we started getting to play somewhat nationally at some video game conventions. And, uh, it's, it's been a, a really fun, oh God, uh, seven, it'll be 17 years or 18 years this summer. Don't, don't count yeah. years. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You'll feel better. Um, and we... Really old. Yeah. 
And we should point out just for for people who are curious that you you play drums, even though there drums. are two guitars sitting behind you. That's going to throw people off. You do play drums. Yeah, don't um, pay attention to those. <laughs> So, so how exactly, like, who came up with the idea and, like, why did you decide to say, like, oh, let's do typical college Nirvana stuff and then also Super Mario Brothers? Like, these two things don't necessarily go hand in hand. And then, like, there isn't, does, does sheet music for this exist? Or did you just, like, play video games a lot, get really drunk, and then, like, work it out as you went along? Um, You know, it's kind of the latter, mostly. But back in the in the late 90s, there was Winamp. I don't know if you guys ever used Winamp on a PC. Oh, yeah. And there were a few websites, one of them was called Zofar's Domain, that had all of these ripped tracks from Nintendo games. And they were called NSF files. So you could get a plug-in for Winamp and then play all of the different parts of the songs that came from the Nintendo songs. So there was a square wave, a triangle wave, a noise file, um, and you could isolate those. So we would decide what instruments were going to play what. And Aaron and Ben would usually take apart the guitar and bass tones, figure those out. And if there was an, any like drum stuff at all, which there usually wasn't, it's usually some kind of strange noise, um, I would figure that out and sometimes write my parts out. Or I would just play along with what they had figured out and try and make that into more rock song. And I don't really know who came up with the idea first. I think it was my friend Aaron. Um, I think he just decided that uh, he really wanted to try this out and we thought it was really funny and weird and we happen to be friends with a lot of nerds that spent a lot of time playing video games. I mean, we did a, I don't know, like a 24 person GoldenEye 64 tournament at one point and we taped it all on VHS. So that was really nerdy and strange. That's awesome. But yeah, it, it, it went from there and uh, it, it's just been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of weird stuff. And something that many bosses, something that many bosses have done really well, um, and I love that separates many bosses from other video game bands or bands that play video game music, is that sticking to guitar and, and managing to create those sounds just with guitars and not using synths. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's listening to Aaron and uh, my friend Robin, who's in the band now too, um, listening to them kind of just to emulate these sounds is, is ridiculous. And it's it's not easy music. I mean, it's really complicated. There's all kinds of running up and down the fretboard and um, not a lot of chords. It's all single notes, a lot of picking. It's just, it's, it's insane. So I have it easy playing drums and uh, a lot of it's just, you know, I get to interpret what it is and okay, I'm gonna make this big noise here and this other noise over here and it turns out, but the the guitar stuff is really what I think people enjoy the most because it sounds a lot like uh, Metallica and Thin Lizzy kind of put together. So, yeah, it's very cool. And you guys have done some pretty insane things. I mean, I I you did show me once a video of you starting. I think it was was it Phoenix Comic Con, like a Comic Con way back in the day, of you with like a snare drum walking through the crowd, like. <laughs> What's amazing yeah. to me is this band that's like so obscure has such a loyal following of because like game nerds are insane about the games that they love. Like how weird was it to be a musician in like that world? <laughs> like I've only been to one con and it wasn't Comic-Con. Like I can only imagine it's just sort of like, whoa. <laughs> it's, it's different. I mean, I've been to, you know, a lot of like, big concerts and big shows where, you know, everybody there is a fan and mini bosses. When we first started playing some of these bigger places, like, um, there's a convention called PAX, the Penny Arcade Expo. Um, and they started out as a online comic, I don't know, in 2002, I want to say, I want to say, um, and they started having conventions up in Washington and they asked us to come up and play for their first one. And I think there's maybe five, 600 people at that. Um, and, we played a lot of shows up to that point where it was, you know, there's this weird band playing at a bar that does video game music. You got to check it out. It's hilarious. Um, to suddenly going to a place where we're with a crowd that actually appreciates it and um, wants to hear things. And I can remember at that show, we did a, a version of Craig Metroid to finish up our set. And we had everybody turn the lights off in the house. And 
people with their Nintendo DSs had lifted up their screens, kind of like people would light a lighter out in the crowd, and they were just holding them and, and moving them back and forth. Uh, nice. It, it's it's so it, it's just good. so different and so bad at the same time. <laughs> it's it it was amazing. I love it. Yeah. And I, I, I just love that that many people have Nintendo DSs in a crowd at a show. Like, that's not what I would ever imagine happening, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it moved on from there. I mean, Penny Arcade over the years started going up to 20, 30, like 60 or 70,000 people um, at their conventions. So there were times we were playing in front of maybe five to 10,000 people, oh. um, just filling up an entire convention center, and we were at the far corner of it. And yeah, that that video, Amy, you're talking about um, is is hilarious. That was another Penny Arcade thing where they had a catwalk built out on the stage, and they had me go out there with a marching snare and a little contact mic, and I had to stand out there in the middle of like four or five thousand people and just start playing, and that was absolutely terrifying. And I played Cause... it twice as fast as I was supposed to. Because so. <laughs> yeah. let's be clear, every good like punk slash rock band really just needs a catwalk that makes sense <laughs> no um that's that's pretty, it does that's make it. a big difference yeah <laughs> good good i'm glad um but you're not much of a gamer which is the interesting part about you being having been in this band for a you know substantial part of your life and it a gazillion keeps years. giving you all these all these experiences but like you're not a huge gamer how like no. go on well, it, okay, you're right. You're calling me on it, which is pretty, pretty uncomfortable. I, I mean, like, I did say this when I introduced you. Like, you're one of my favorite people in the world because, like, you're my best friend. So I know things about you. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, so I'm calling yeah. you on it. See, that's true. Okay, so I should say that there's a way to clarify that a little bit. I never had a Nintendo. And Mini Bosses is exclusively 8-bit Nintendo. Um, and I had a, a Sega Genesis for a few years growing up. Um, at my dad's house, but I could only play that when I was seeing my dad, so maybe once every other month. Um, but I was really into computer gaming. I had a Commodore 64 growing up, so my stepfather would, uh, I guess, you know, steal illegally tons and tons of games, lots of inappropriate games that children shouldn't play. I got to play those. Um, but yeah, once we got into college, I never had a PlayStation. Um, I was just kind of stuck. And my friends growing up that did have a Nintendo uh, weren't always that great at sharing it. So I wouldn't get a chance to play Castlevania. So a lot of the times when I was learning the music, I knew what the game was. And I maybe played it for 20 minutes once when I was 12 or 13. But while everybody would know all of the movements in the medley that we were putting together by name, you know, this is the part of the, of the game when this guy shoots the guy with the axe and blows up or something. Um, I don't know what they are. So a lot of the times it was so hard for me because I'd be like, uh, what part is this? This is part six, part 19, because the NSFs were all cut up into chunks and some of them had 80, 90 parts. Mm. So it was really difficult for me to get that together, especially yeah. when we were at practice and they'd be like, oh yeah, we're going to do this thing with Seamus. And I'm like, I, I don't know what part that is. So yeah, being in a Nintendo cover band, I'm the one that never had a Nintendo growing up. But uh, although you didn't have a Nintendo and you didn't have a PlayStation in college, in college were you still playing uh, PC games? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't really have a PC. I had some friends who had um, like X Wing versus Tie Fighter. Okay. Uh, again, this is just showing how old I am. Um, and I lived next door to a guy uh, who had a Sega Saturn, so we got to play some um, Saturn games, which didn't last long, but they're still pretty fun. And, yeah, actually, I think when I moved to Phoenix uh, and Aaron and I moved in together, we actually had a PlayStation or a PlayStation 2 at some point. So that was kind of my first, oh, my own personal um, uh, gaming console that I got to have. And then years later, the band, um, we all bought ourselves uh, Xbox 360s for a while. But, yeah, now I, I still don't even have a console. I yeah. play some PC games. I play... Um, Terrible space program obsessively. Like I noticed the other day on Steam that it says I'm up at like 800 hours. Oh, <laughs> so, impressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should have probably put some of those 800 hours to better use, but hey. Nah. Amy, was, did, you, no. did you have consoles growing up? I had a Super Nintendo. Okay. That's all I ever had. My cousin yeah. had the classic Nintendo. And because he had that, I wanted to, I wanted something. And then he got a Sega and that was it between... 
my whole family, those are the three. So consequently, the only games I ever played are like the classic Mario games. Mm -hmm. And they're still the only things I played. Um, I have them all on an emulator now. Hmm. And I still have not beaten Super Mario Brothers 3. Yeah. Because of my, so like growing up, my mom would say like, you know, okay, you can have a half hour of Nintendo time for a half hour of piano time. Hmm. So it was never like, I didn't get to just like sit around and just like beat a game in a weekend. Yeah. I don't think I beat Super Mario World until I was like in my 20s. <laughs> I also, so, yeah, I do have to say that, that, that it's pronounced Mario in the States, not Mario. Sorry. Thank um, you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you, you you guys have a, <laughs> have a longer history than I do. So you can call her out on that. I was going to be nice. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you. I, <laughs> She's yeah. Canadian, though, Anyways. so... Yeah. We'll, we'll let that go. polite and industrious, people. Uh, Jason, what about you? Are you... What's your secret gamer's... Well, oh, Yeah, so... getting over the cold, my voice just cracked. Your secret gamer voice. <laughs> gamer. <laughs> Stop it, Amy. <laughs> Still um, my favorite Simpsons voice. Yes. Uh, um, teenage Homer. So I didn't... Yeah, I didn't uh, have a platform... Um, for the longest time, my parents didn't uh, ever seem to want to buy into the whole video game thing for whatever reason. Uh, but we would just watch endless amounts of TV and movies, which was weird. But no video games for us. So um, I guess I chose my best friend at the time um, because he had a Nintendo. So I would go over and spend the night at his house on the weekends. Vital criteria. Just so we could like Perfect. stay up all night, not sleep, and beat games. It was amazing. And then I would come yeah. home to my non-video game home and be really sad and couldn't wait till the next weekend. And, you know, I thinking back now, I don't think that my friend and I really liked each other that much. But, um, you know, I was somebody to play games with. So and yeah. he had the platform for me to play. So that was great. So that was the NES. Then eventually, I guess my family finally got uh, a Super Nintendo. So that was the, the platform that I had when I was at home and up until... I left for college, I guess. Maybe, I think we got a, what was after that, the Nintendo 64. Um, but I never really played that that much. It was kind of after my time, I guess. But um, yeah, so that, and then when I was an adult, um, which I still don't think I am, but I think the the only platform I've ever purchased was, uh, was a 360, Xbox 360. So I still have that. I th- actually think I have a PlayStation 2. I don't think I... I think I bought that because there was a, a great Star Trek game on that. But have that, uh, the 360, the Super Nintendo, and maybe one other. But yeah, I've just got a, got a bunch of consoles sitting and have a, a TV dedicated to video games. You still have all the consoles. Oh, yeah. Wow. Impressive. Nice. I'm a, my, I'm yeah, a my... hardware person and, and a, yeah. a, like a, a tactile person and a thing person. So, you know, and I think I always will be. I'm not a hoarder, but I like having physical things. So instead of having emulators or, or having digital music, you know, I still buy everything physical, physical books, physical music, um, physical yeah. music. That sounds funny, but yeah. I know what you mean though. But yeah, no, I'm the same way. My, my Super Nintendo is still hooked up in my parents' house in the basement and it still works. I don't play it, but there's there's something to be said for like, especially the physicality of a controller, which is something that like I only learned recently that you can get USB adapted controllers. Isn't that awesome? And it was like a total game changer because I'm never gonna bring my of all the things at my parents' house that I want to bring down to California. The Super Nintendo is like relatively low on the list, but I like having a controller so I can actually like play real games. It's kind of awesome. And here's the other thing for me, me feel like too. An epic like, nerd. With those games, like those are still and always will be, I think, the games I love and the games I want to play. Because I don't know if it's just because I'm too old and pathetic, but all the new games are way too complicated for me because they go like 360 degrees and go all over the place. I just want my scrolling left to right. I mean, oh, that's that's what I need. 2D in side scroller. Yes. And there's something I feel like about. I don't know, the violence of modern video games or like, why do I want to play a game where like I am being shot at or I am at war or something? There's something that's so cute to me about a plumber jumping on turtles. I'm like, this is just fun. This is just adorable. Like, I don't know. I mean, that game's pretty violent too, just in a cutesy way. It's pretty violent. It's just cute. (laughs) But it's so cute. There are still bullets in Mario Brothers. I mean, they're just moving very slowly. And gigantic and bullets slow. too, and right. axes yeah, swinging true. from the ceiling, and oh man! <laughs> okay, yeah, fine. and you still die. 
you, you die. can die you a horrible do. death. Yes. Falling between cracks and whatever that is. Yes. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot there's a lot of like when you think about it falling between cracks into the oblivion, which is just like that's actually really creepy. <laughs> it is. <sighs> no, it's a terrifying well, game. But you also think back to games that uh, you know are popular around the time that uh, these games were out that we're talking about, and think about the arcade games. I mean, that's around the time that like Mortal Kombat was out, and that was right. a horribly graphic game for the time. I mean, it still is. It's pretty disgusting, it's but still pretty I mean, graphic. Yeah, there's an arcade pretty pretty close to me that has it's like you ten dollars free play for an hour, which is awesome. Um, and they have the Mortal Kombat games, and I like I never played them, and there there's a lot of blood and a lot of like mm -hmm. real violence, and it's just like how no wonder kids are kind of fucked up. <laughs> well, when you get a when when you would get the Mortal Kombat game for like your Sega or something for home in the nineties, all the blood was disabled. Yeah, like that's all right. the all that gore was really? taken out. Yep. But there was a code and you could, you know, mash in your code and the blood would come back. Yep. So my friend, uh, my best friend of high school, Dan, he had a, a Sega in the basement and he got Mortal Kombat and his mom was very adamant about us not, you know, having a gory game down there, but we would just punch in the gore codes and just right. wasn't there even a gore Rip code spines. for MB NBA Jam? I feel like there was. Oh. Yeah, you know, there what? there might have been. There Sorry, NBA Jam, like the basketball? Yeah. yeah. Oh, there were all sorts of codes for that. The Big Head and, oh, man, there were so many. And you could get Bill Big Clinton. Remember playing Bill Clinton? That was fun. <laughs> what? Okay, this is a level of gamedom that I've never experienced. They, yeah. they built so many things into games back then, and there wasn't the internet, so not everybody knew, but they had these things called magazines that were for gamers, mm. and they would have yeah. all the codes in there. Nintendo Power. Yes. <laughs> Huh. Did either of you ever play with the power glove? <laughs> I I that have worn a so power cool. glove. Yeah. Um I don't know what that is. It sounds questionable though. <laughs> in in a in the uh the life of a video game music nerd, um I've come across a lot of power gloves. Um there's a few bands that people have modded have those, right? Them. Yeah. Yeah, they they use a lot of chiptune guys will use that. Um and there's a band called uh, Proto Men where they've done a couple of like basically operas based on video game characters. Wow. And there's there's a lot of power glove usage. It's it's pretty fantastic, but one of the best things you can do for yourself is to go and watch one of the power glove commercials from the from the 90s. Or, yeah. Is it 90s? Early 90s? They're Those hilarious. are just awesome. Amazing. The yeah. definition what of awesome. What is the power glove? It's a glove that you wore. It was a, a glove controller. So you wore this yeah. glove oh. and it had like it buttons on it and stuff. Power. But Nintendo was so progressive when it came to technology huh. and video games and it's so funny because even some of that stuff that was you know existed back then was incorporated in games like i don't know i don't think ever reached its full potential and some they, they tried again with the wii with some of the stuff i guess but you know they, right. they they had the uh the power pad is that what it was called the track and field that would yep. be a cool thing to somehow mod for drums. I don't know, make the <laughs> make the different oh, spots with your feet, like do crazy drum stuff. Well, but... there was um, Robbie the Robot too. There was that game where the robot would balance the discs yeah. on the Nintendo. Mm -hmm. That wasn't very popular, but I had a girlfriend in college who absolutely loved that. That would be the only game she'd play. It was pretty funny. Nintendo also had the the laser gun too. I mean, they just yep. had all these cool apparatuses that were like for video games um huh. and i don't know why the power glove never caught on but it was short-lived yeah it was it was awkward maybe there'll be a comeback <laughs> all the i mean we we are in the stuff. age of like nostalgia, nostalgia revival sure. across all things so yep. like didn't didn't i see i feel like matt you probably sent it to me that like they were reissuing original nintendo but like in mini form mm -hmm. yes so that you could have on getting one Oh, yeah, gosh. no, those oh. things sold out so fast. I'm sure they'll mm -hmm. they'll get in stock again. But yeah, they were a hot item before Christmas. Huh. Um, yeah, I wanted one, but apparently it was one of those things that like you had to get it the day they announced it. Yeah, and I did yeah. not. Hmm. Maybe maybe in the future they'll run some more. But yeah, I mean they looked great. They looked like the apps, like the real machine, just yeah, tiny. Slightly small, but like it, ha works, it has like right? how many games? It has like fifty, not not fifty. I don't think that one has fifty, but it has a certain like number of games something. like built into it, like on a hard drive. Huh. All so, the popular okay. ones, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, I've got a similar machine. I think that's a Sega that did the same thing. It's like a compact version of some Sega system that's got like fifty games on it. 
Oh, that would be fun. It's got a bunch of Sonic. Yeah. Beast again. Got a bunch of Sonic Hedgehog. So. But I was never like I never had a Sega growing up, so I didn't really play those games other than uh, arcade form. You know, most of the Sega games I played were arcade games. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Sega had some really good stuff. We, uh, boy, we had Altered Beast, which is a great like shape shifting game. Um, there was Hang On, and that was really popular in the arcades. Um, one of my favorites was this one called Zaxxon 3D, where Sega, you, you would get a pair of 3D glasses that were absolutely terrible. Um, but it was, you would use a light gun and you would shoot intercon- intercontinental ballistic missiles out of the sky before they could, you know, crash into the earth or something like that. It was really weird. Mm. But I just, I love that game because it was weird. so futuristic, but it was just terrible. I mean, you had to get right in front of the TV to actually shoot and hit anything, so... It's good. Yeah. Let's encourage our, our children to sit right in front of the TV, <laughs> which like I feel like we should clarify is like the old school TV where it was like, you know, a box this thick, I don't know, two feet thick. And like you shouldn't sit right up to it because of, you know, TV rays or whatever. Yeah. Damage your eyes. <laughs> the damaging TV rays. Yes. Yeah. Not not modern TVs where it's just an LED screen. No, the ones That's that right. like if you look at it too closely, you will die. <laughs> apparently yeah, and i love 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 um, love love super nintendo and always will that's my my main love but uh brought up arcade games kind of a big fan of arcade games and as an adult you know it, it is exciting to see just how popular like barcades are knowing that yeah. really any any city i'm in i can look up and find a, a bar that has arcade games well and, and phoenix now has two at least two i think some of recently Cobra. closed there was one on Mill that closed recently, I think. But I think Cobra is yeah. still around, yeah. And, and then there's one up on um, uh, Camelback and Central. Mm. Um, why can I not remember the name? Because I live within walking distance. You know, um, I was thinking that something. because of the popularity, like geek culture is pop culture and like the popularity of arcades and stuff, the mini bo- mini bosses should look at uh, or approach breweries to see about doing a collab. Just saying. they there's been some talk. There's a there's a place in Glendale out here called Eight Bit Brewing. Yes, uh, I've been that, there. Have you? See, I, I need have. to go there. Nice. Yes. Um, and they've, they've, they've shown some interest that, in doing that. Their their tap handles, I think, are um, NES controllers. Yeah. It's really oh cool. Oh my god, yeah. that's awesome and so yeah. nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> and I work in Glendale, so I should go there. So, I work in Peoria, so. Uh, I work for the city of Peoria, point. so. Yeah. Yay. Neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys have you guys have Phoenix and Maricopa County and weird city things in common. <laughs> yes, we do. Um Yeah. And we don't observe and daylight I, savings. We don't. It's the only it, way to that do it. threw me it's off like not. mad when I lived in Arizona. I couldn't figure out like why this state decided to be difficult. Like yeah, every other state decided to be difficult. Savings. Yeah. That's that's really what it is. <laughs> Jason's right. Yeah. But still it was always very confusing. <laughs> I don't need another thing that messes with my my body clock, you know, twice yeah. a year. I mean, alcohol. But then and you don't have the joy enough, of so. like getting a, a free hour in the fall. Yeah, that but you don't best. lose one either. That's right. True. Okay. True. We'll keep that. That, that one hour is not worth the aggravation. It's not. <laughs> I mean, fine, fine. I don't like it either. I just live somewhere where I have to do it. I mean, I could just, like, be on Mountain Standard Time forever, but then I'd just be offset from my life by an hour. It also confuses okay. me to no end that Vegas is on Pacific Time. Wait, what? Really? Yeah. Yep. I did not know that. Vegas is Pacific Because I don't ever time, looked at I don't a get watch that. when I'm in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. There is no time in Vegas. There's no, Vegas, I guess there's no clocks yeah. in the casinos. Yeah. yeah. No, there's n- I don't think I've ever noticed a clock aside from in a hotel room. Yeah, that I'm thinking about. There is it. no time in Vegas. Like, there's no, there's also no windows in Vegas, right? Like they deliberately do not want you to know what time it is. Right. It's so terrifying. you feel less bad when it's three in the morning and you're at the bar, and you're still sitting at the bar, still putting your money <laughs> into that machine. You know, <laughs> it's funny. Like being in a casino is kind of like an analog for being on a deep space voyage. No windows, you can't see out. You're trapped in there with weird smells for a long period of time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the weird smells. And it's. Yeah, the weird smell. It does smells. smell weird Ugh. there. It does. It does. It's the it's the smoking inside that just Laughlin like... is worse. And I've described this to many people, but when I'm in a in a casino in Laughlin, the smell is 
cigarettes, old people, and death. It's yeah. really a depressing place. That yep. sounds horrible. It is that horrible. That just sounds like the smell of sadness. Pe- people go there waiting to die. Like, it is just an awful place. That was the one, the, there's one casino in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I did my undergrad. Um, there was one casino, and it was always just, like, exclusively old women whose husbands had died who were just gambling away their retirement funds because they had nothing else to do anymore. And it was just, like, you never saw young people, like, doing anything. It was it was almost exclusively old people. It was so sad. Can yeah. I have a question, though, about Canadian casinos, because well, yeah. I, I grew up pretty close to Montreal, but I've never gone to the casinos up there on the river. But I've always wondered. So if you if you lose a lot of money when you leave a Canadian casino, do they just give it back to you because they feel sorry for you? Like, <laughs> is that is that a thing? I mean, Thank you. No. <laughs> yeah, we're sorry. I've been waiting to make we're... that joke for like 25 years. So finally, happened. Fantastic we're sorry joke. you lost you. your money. Here's a gift bag of your money. Um <laughs> No, I in no, the one time I gambled in a casino in Canada, I put five dollars I got five dollars worth of nickels and then played the nickel slots until I ran out of nickels because then it was fr- I think and it wasn't even free drinks. It was twenty five cent drinks, which is mm. so weird. Um but yeah, I just like I think it was like three hours. I don't even remember who I went with, but it was only once and it was very weird. And we just yeah, we did the slots for the cheap drinks because we figured it would be a, a thing to do. And um I lost five whole dollars. I miss being able to use coins in the machines, and I miss getting coins out of the machines. Yeah, I feel like that would just be the fun, tactile sensation of winning anything, of just, like, coins instead of just, yeah. like, beeps. I've and only beeps had a fun. sensation of putting coins in. I've never had them <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the norm, I think. But, uh, yeah. you know, in this age of nostalgia, I, I see it coming back somewhere. Somebody the, digging the physical, up those old machines and yeah, just having a casino. Physically full putting of in a coin, pulling the thing, and having that that sensation of yeah. Yeah, they probably you're have the working old, for your loss. Actually, places <laughs> still have those. They don't have the old uh, slot machines, but they have the old cigarette machines, which is always funny to see when you walk by those. I have seen those. Oh yeah, I've seen the, those in like modern cigarette machines. Yeah. it's yeah. so weird. It's so weird that they're like in bars. Yeah, I don't know. I would I have one of those I've in my only, apartment. As long as it wasn't dispensing cigarettes. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like I figure out something on the way down there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the boxes of candy it would work. It would totally work. Um, I feel like before we get into space, because we're going to get into space soon, because we should. I don't know. Oh, I've got a good segue. Do you have a segue? Because I was going to ask I... Matt about his other band very briefly, because I don't think, Jason, that I told you about this one. Treasure Mammal. Okay. Treasure Mammal, which I describe to people, it's not really a band so much as like weird experiential art because the last time I saw Treasure Mammal, I ended up on somebody's shoulders in the conga line. Wow. That's yeah. Cute. Yeah. I forget it wasn't what my shoulders, was. though. It was not your shoulders. <laughs> it was your friend Mig's shoulders. That's right. <laughs> he That's saw right. that I was not involved enough, so he came and like crawled under my legs, stood up, and then suddenly I was on his shoulders and then I could not be, not be in a conga line. And there was an inflatable Santa Claus that fell on me. And I think it fell on you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. Knocked, it was like two, you this is ages that ago. Sounds trippy. Um, so you do other music too. I don't know if you want to if you want to kind of mention some of like sure, your other part. weird side projects that are sure. you know are also yeah. you know around Phoenix because you because because Treasure Mammal's like actively playing shows right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mini Bosses is uh, on kind of hiatus, but Treasure Mammal, um, we are active. Um, Amy, you kind of described it perfectly. It's it's more of an experience than anything. Um, it's my friend Abe Gill. Uh, he started this band in 2004 um, as a single guy and a sampler and some strange outfits and a funny looking microphone. Um, and at times it sounds like a motivational speakers set gone really wrong. Um, we now have two drummers, uh, myself and my friend Jeff. He's Jeff Wright, and I, my stage name is Jeff Wrong. Um, and we have dancers that wear custom-made um, body suits. I forgot about the dancers. Um, yeah, can't forget about the dancers. Uh, and it's it's just really interesting, weird, strange, odd, and a lot of fun. Um, we have inflatable Christmas things. We had a giant inflatable Scooby-Doo we brought to South by Southwest. Um and uh, yeah, we're about to start recording a new album um, in the next couple of weeks, I think. Uh, and yeah, we're uh, 
we're really weird. It sounds like you, you guys, guys have... would have played a lot of uh, Trunk Space. All the time at Trunk Space. Um, that's where I was the last time I saw you guys, like it. two years ago. Trunk yeah. Space. Well, now um, there's a new Trunk Space. Yes. The new Trunk Space is um, in a church downtown, and it's a fantastic space. Awesome. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a yeah. show coming up in March there. So. Yeah. The weirdest thing come, about you guys yeah. is that you have like this cult following. Like it's like it's such a, it's such an obscure. I don't know. I, I've always wanted to see one of the shows. What's that bar that you guys do downtown a lot that I've never been to? It's not Valley Bar, but it's the other one that like Pressing you want. Yes, that like yes. you will have two hundred people rolling around on the floor. Yeah. Like it's like it's just so weird. It's like it's really an experience of like oddity and strangeness and costumes. You guys do that at Crescent. And, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we haven't done it there in a while, um, but it's. Yeah, it, it's great. Um, Amy, they've got very, good, they've got good beer there, and they've got good burritos. They do, do they? Have really oh, good yeah. bean and cheese burritos. Yeah. Yes. I, I and now they have a, a deck outside. I have not been there since oh. the deck, but I've driven by it. Oh. Yeah, it looks awesome. It's nice. 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 Very nice. So yeah, that's that's your other. I just feel like you can't not mention like if we're going into all the no, weird that's of like awesome. game I'm glad stuff, you brought that like, up. <laughs> gotta mention Treasure Mammal. It's honestly, I think I've seen Treasure Mammal. I don't know, like six or seven times. It's it's like the weirdest. I never really know what's going to happen. And it's like the best part is, is like you guys played in L.A. once. And it was one of those like, like, I forget where downtown, but I'm never going Paris back space. there ever again. Because, yes, Paraspace. Because it was like some. OK, good. Because that was the most annoying venue in the world. It was like <laughs> some some rich kid who like self-produced because of money, their own album and like had an album release party that you guys are just words. You guys are supposed to play at like 11, but this yeah. kid just played for like three hours because it was like masturbation for him. And then you weren't on till like 1 a.m. and you still yeah. got people rolling on the floor and like, like doing all <laughs> of Abe's weirdness with you. It's just like, it's such a weird, like it's such a trip to see that yeah. happen. So yeah, <laughs> that was, I think that was the first time you saw Treasure Mammal. Uh, I think that might have been. I think it might have been. There, there were like six you people. You guys were all so angry. <laughs> It was, it was oh. I, yeah, it was the strangest group of people that were there for this kid's, like, self-produced, horrible album of, like, whiny stuff. I don't know. It was just <laughs> terrible. But, yeah, it was it was, it was was interesting. It was an experience. We'll, we'll put it at that. Yeah, um, it, was, it was a good time. So since we've moved away from gaming, I feel like, Jason, we probably killed your segue into space. No, because I'm going to bring up gaming okay, again good. just to have the segue. <laughs> but yeah. we were talking about arcade games. And have have either of you played Michael Jackson's Moonwalker? I played Years the Commodore ago. 64 version of it. Really? Okay. Yeah. It is, is that the old one? It's awesome and creepy and awesome because the whole point of the game is to like save the children. So you're Michael Jackson, you go really around and like dance, yeah. you like kill the bad guys by dancing. <laughs> And your like special <laughs> move is dancing, and then you go and like save the children. And all the children like huddle around Michael. It's it's, it's I remember this so so yeah. wrong, but kind of epic. Yeah, I do. And there's a boombox, right, where yeah. the music's supposed to be coming from. Yes. <sighs> yep. And I forget like the that credits is... of it are, are so funny too because it's so like very much egocentric, Michael Jackson. You know, it's like Michael Jackson presents or produced by Michael Jackson. Like his name is just everywhere. And he's just this God who's coming to save everyone <laughs> with his dancing. We need a little window of this when, when you guys edit this just to show oh, yeah. what this looks like. Oh, it I, is, I remember seeing it and it's it's fantastic. It is incredible. I've seen it yeah. uh, now in, in a few few of the barcades I've gone to. And uh, that's just endless fun, especially when beer is involved. Is it at Copa yeah. in Phoenix? Because if it is... I don't know. I don't know. It could That's be. So weird. I'd have to check on that. But uh, anyway, okay. So Moonwalker <clears throat> is sort of space-related. So we can transition. Oh, one one other thing I wanted to bring up, and I don't think many bosses yeah. ever, ever uh, played this song, but one of my favorite sort of kind of space-related songs in a video game ever would be from DuckTales, the moon level. No, we if didn't. you're not familiar with that, you should listen to that song. That song is kind of epic. And I know it best from, from the, uh, 
Game Boy version, but I think the music is the same in the Nintendo version, in the NES version. But yes, DuckTales, the moon level, awesome music. We we have played the DuckTales theme. Really? Not oh, the theme, level. nice. But there's another 8-bit cover band called The Advantage. That's I don't think they're around anymore, but they did do that. That's awesome. It's, it's, I'm going to have to check that out. All right, let's talk space, Amy. So Moonwalkers. Um, who's your favorite Moonwalker, Matt? Because uh, I know you can name them all anyways. Besides Michael uh, Jackson? Yeah. Real um, Moonwalker. You know what? I got to go with Gene Cernan. Mm. I, I, I really do. I mean, I also love Al Bean a lot because he's just really cute. Um, but for some reason, Gene Cernan's always stuck in my mind. And it might be because of that, the, the first Space Fest that I went to that I met you at, um, I was coming back from my car. I'd parked in the, in the basement of this really beautiful resort that they have Space Fest at. And Gene Cernan had just left his car and was walking into the elevator by himself, just carrying like a, a briefcase. And I, I was standing there thinking, okay, the, the last man on the moon is is about to take an elevator and he's like... 50 feet in front of me and need to be on this elevator with this guy. So I, I, I didn't want to run and be like that terrifying guy that's suddenly running at someone, you know, who's elderly, but I did kind of run and try to get right to that, that, that uh, elevator door and, and sneak in there and ride with him. And I just caught it as the doors were closing and then walked up one flight and saw him again. But it was, it was pretty impressive. And then, I guess seeing him at the the Space Fest in Pasadena, what was that, two years ago now? Three years ago? Three years ago? Yeah, three years ago. I happened to be outside, like on the phone, almost every time that he showed up and got out of his van. So he was always there, and I was just taking these weird pictures of Gene Cernan climbing out of I've seen those pictures. Yeah, Yeah, actually, now that you mention it, I've seen those pictures. You had so many pictures of like, it's so funny because it's like an indistinct old man getting out of a car. (laughs) You don't know who you're looking at. It's just like, this is the one funny thing with Space Fest, um, which is like, like, you never, nowhere else will you have to pay a lot of attention to the old men in the room because the old men might be the people who walked on the moon, um, which is pretty fun. So tell, tell us where your fascination with space comes from. Well, um, I think it comes from my first grade classroom. Um, I wasn't a strong reader, and I, I, I was put into this thing called a multi-age classroom, which was like an experimental thing in the early 80s where the idea was kind of like uh, you cram first, second, and third graders all into a room together with one teacher, and the teacher would teach the third graders, and that would trickle down to the second graders and the first graders. It was kind of like trickle-down education. Um, So I didn't learn to read properly, Um, but there was a space book uh, on a shelf that my teacher had gotten, and I remember picking it up, and it was all pictures of men walking on the moon, so there was all this beautiful like color pictures of Apollo and I was maybe like seven I guess at the time seven or eight and that was the book like I would go to every time that I wanted to take something home with me um, to read or do a project on and my parents were always like well you know what, what do you what would you like to have as like a birthday gift or a Christmas gift and that kind of spawned me asking for anything I could get my hands on that was related to space mm-hmm. So I'd get all these um, books about, you know, supersonic flight and uh, things like that. And then for the the very brief time in my life that I actually had cable television growing up, we had Nickelodeon. And uh, I was watching all these strange British, like, sci-fi shows. Um, And then my stepfather introduced me to the original Star Trek. And I got completely obsessed with that. I started reading all the Star Trek novels. Um, then I went into, uh, Arthur Clarke novels. Um, and at that point I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to be an astronaut. And, um, that's kind of how I started to point my life. And that obviously didn't happen because I'm still sitting here on earth talking to you guys. But, um, that just led into like a lifelong fascination with it. And, um, even through high school, like I convinced my high school science teacher to create an astronomy class. Hmm and a meteorology class. Um, 
and we went on really cool field trips and then I went and did astronomy for college and yeah so I've never really kind of given up that on that first book that I read in first grade or whatever and I still love going back and watching all the old Star Treks and getting obsessed with uh I started finally started watching Deep Space Nine because I didn't watch that in the '90s, and now I'm three seasons into that. So yeah, it's been it's been a really it's been a really uh, lifelong kind of passion. I guess. Did you watch Next Generation? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I will put that on and watch that whenever I need to just zone out. It's it's fantastic, and I have a few friends out here too that also love it that I can quote episodes at. But that's not awesome. as many as I would like. Yeah, yeah, Next Gen became my obsession. And then, you know, I mean, yeah, I do credit that um, kind of starting, not really starting, but fueling my obsession with space and space exploration. Um, and I never really got into the original, and I've tried many times. Um, I like it for what it is, but Next Gen was always my love and uh watched deep space nine when it was on never watched voyager but mm. only in the recent in recent years started watching voyager because i became friends with an actor on voyager and i was like yeah i should probably really? watch voyager so oh that's cool so interesting and i've got to ask since we're we're both uh in phoenix ha have you been to the challenger space center i haven't okay and i i've actually really? Yeah. Even I've been there, and I only lived there for three years. Make <laughs> it happen. I, I have well, a bit of a sore spot for, for them, actually. I tried to intern there out of college um, at one in Massachusetts. Hmm. and I, But I don't really think I understood the idea of that. Uh, and hi, Pete. That an intern makes no money. Um, and I got kind of frustrated with them. I, I've tried. I applied a few times out here to them when they were looking for uh, positions like maybe 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in Peoria, isn't it? It is in Peoria. And, uh, you know, I would, at some point, I need to go back to, I haven't been for a couple of years, but I feel that it, at some point it's kind of like an obligation, but also something that would uh, benefit me selfishly, should get some fellow space geeks together and, and approach them and try to help them do something more awesome than they do. Um, yeah. Amy will probably agree but you know it just it should be it, a lot more awesome than it is it was disappointing yeah. it was one of the first i think i went there i'd been living in the states for like a year or so and i was really excited to see like a thing with space things what are you pete's like debating scratching his face here <laughs> it's pretty great mm -hmm. um yeah, I, I was I wanted it to be way more exciting than it was. Like the coolest thing they have is like a simulator of the space station, which is like a room that is built to look like the space station. Not really. Like they have some it's like honestly, they have really cool models. Like that's fun, but yeah, they need to up their game. Yeah, that's I think that was the, their big thing was they would have um you know, kids groups and school groups up there to do like mock missions. Which is which is really great, um, and I tried to do that for some of the schools that I've taught at, um, but I could just never get permission to do any field trips. Hmm. Which is thanks Arizona. Um, yep. But yeah, story. it's that's another thing. Like I out here in Phoenix, I mean, we've got this desert where there's so many, so much opportunity for dark skies, and there's so much space science going on in, in ASU, U of A, and um, Discovery Channel Telescope is up at a NAU. But there's just so little outreach, especially in Phoenix. Like I never, I never really hear about any of like uh, like the Saguaro Astronomy Club or Phoenix, um, or the Phoenix uh, Astronomical Society doing much in the way of public outreach. And or it's anything insane like that. because yeah. both ASU and U of A are so actively involved in things happening in space right now. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's different. It's a completely different story in Tucson. Where you've got U of A and the Flandreau uh, uh, Planetarium, they do stuff all the time. I mean, they do things with bars. I mean, there's even Space Bar um, down in Tucson. Uh, that's less of space theme than I personally think it should be. But um, don't they have a telescope there or something? They do. They have a couple. And every time okay. I've gone there, hoping to use the telescope, 
there's been nobody around to do it, and they won't let me use it. You know, but, they uh, used to. I don't think it, it it's around anymore. I'll have to look. But I know in Tucson, I think it was actually south of Tucson, but there used to be a hotel that was, like, themed with astronomy. And they I had stayed there once. telescopes that you could, like, use. Nice. And, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was the Vega Bray Observatory. Yeah, that's right. Spend a night there. Um, it's no longer a bed and breakfast. It's okay. just an observatory. Okay. But it was, oh, my God, Pete, you were. <laughs> I'm sorry. My cat's still under the back. No, I'm glad he finally came out today. Yeah, he wants to say hi. Good. Um, yeah, he he likes Matt, so you know he wants to say hi to you. I I feel like I should I should pre- preface this or explain this that everybody who on the internet who ever asks me what I do with Pete when I travel for weeks at a time, he drives I drive him to Phoenix and he stays with Matt. So Matt's my long term cat sitter. <laughs> yes, and yeah, although you're wearing for like twelve months or twelve weeks at one point. Some. Yeah, I think you've had him for yeah. when I was in Australia and then was traveling right on the heels of Australia. I was gone for like seven and a half weeks. I think you had him for nine weeks because I just couldn't. <laughs> I'm not going to leave him alone and just yeah. have like a rotating cast of people come in to be like, all right, hi, Pa. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> here's some food. Go about your business. Yeah, I want him to be cared for. Um, he knows that you're talking to Matt, so that's why he's hanging out. <laughs> he knows. He's he's a clever kitty, this yeah, one. He... Um but yeah, no, speak, speaking of Matt, um, yeah, you just mentioned trying to like do things at the Challenger Center and stuff because um, you are a teacher of humans, um, yes. <laughs> I which, I, which I always say, yeah, we should, I feel like we should also say that like you are a math and science teacher and currently working with, um, I mean, I tell people that like you work with felons, but that's not entirely exclusively no. the case, is it? No, I, I work with uh, probationers. Um, it, I mean, you work mostly, with scary people. But... <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. But I, I would say most of the people that come in, so I teach adult ed, and uh, most of the people that we work with, uh, I work for the Superior Court, so we do have people that come in that are on probation or parole um, or that have um, you know, been to jail or prison. Um, but we also work with the community. Um, but it's, it's a very different situation than a traditional um, teaching classroom because – Everybody's there because they they have something they need to get done. Either they want to improve their English, they want to um, get ready for college, or they want their GED. So it's not the kind of situation that I've been in the past where um, if I have a difficult student, it involves um, working with the principal and all of this. It's if there's somebody who's who's difficult um, as an adult, we can tell them that you know this program is just not suitable for them, and uh, if you know they need to find some place else to go. So it's, it's a lot different. Um, and I've taught middle school all the way through high school and adults. And it's, it's really, it's, it's challenging, but it's, it's really rewarding sometimes too. It's watching people who've been unsuccessful for whatever reason in their lives at getting, um, getting into college or getting a high school diploma, um, or just weren't ready as kids to be, um, to be in a you know, formal education setting, uh, you know, I've got people who are in their 80s who are trying to get a GED. Um, so, yeah, it's different. Um, and I try to let some of my space nerdery come out uh, while I'm with them. But usually the, the least favorite topic is science. Um, you know, after Because it's so course. scary. Because it's terrifying. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's that's that's a hard thing to do. But um, I mean, well, I've Amy, I've used some of your videos in class before, um, but really getting people interested in, in the cool stuff, the interesting stuff that's out there and seeing, you know, where the science, uh, sometimes the science fiction crosses over. That's a lot of fun. So that's one of the things I enjoy about educating a lot. Yeah. And that's a really good segue to discuss the fact that you also educate people through writing books. Dude. Speaking of science and science fiction. Yeah. Um, I know this because I edited your book, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, you uh, you recently finished your first book and you're working on a second right now um, about science and science fiction. So, uh, yeah, tell us about your your book because like it is good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's my first Amazon review right there. <laughs> but uh, oh, I'll I'll leave that on Amazon. It's good. It is. It is good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I, I wrote a book uh, for. Because the age group is 12 to 15 year olds, but really kind of anybody who's interested in, in how science fiction and science kind of go hand in hand. Mm. Um, 
and it's uh, it's something I've always kind of wanted to do in the back of my mind, I think, for years and years and years. And I was lucky enough to get the opportunity with a, a company called Nomad Press out of my home state, actually, which is weird. Um, which is Vermont, we should say, because you keep mentioning that you grew up close to Canada, but you didn't say where you grew up. So Vermont. <laughs> Vermont. It's close to Canada. That's that's, that's our the state tagline. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, we make Ben and Jerry's. Um, we have really good beer. And it's cold most of the year. Yeah, but, uh, good. Because what yeah. you want when you're freezing is ice cream and beer. I do. <laughs> but that's Doesn't just weird. Much. I was just I was just in in uh, again, you anyone who's listening to this in March, uh, in January, I was in Provo, Utah, and it was minus seventeen degrees Celsius, which I think is about five degrees Fahrenheit. And um there's like four ice cream stores with walk in within walking distance of my hotel, and everyone was like, There's really great ice cream in town. And I'm like, I can barely no. feel my face. Why do I want to put cold inside no. my body? <laughs> um, yeah, but that was pretty interesting. Anyways, go on. You wrote a book about science and science fiction. I did. Um, it doesn't include ice cream, but yeah. I suppose, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody could eat ice cream in the cold while they're reading it too. There you go. Um, but it's geared for uh, parents, uh, educators, and, and kids that um, – want to know a little bit more about how real some of the science fiction is. Mm. Um, for example, I guess we talk about, uh, you know, whether or not we can actually clone a dinosaur, um, bring them back to life, um, how likely, uh, you know, robots are to be our friends and then, you know, murder us in our sleep and take over our lives. Um, faster than light travel, um, finding space aliens. I talk all about that in there. And it's, it, it, it was really a lot of fun for me to write. Um, just because they were all things that I loved growing up. I mean, yeah. I loved the Jurassic Park movies and, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek and all these, you know, great novels that were coming out in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and that was just kind of a natural extension. Um, it's also got neat little activities or labs for um, people to do uh, with their kids. So if you've got like a, you know, a miniature human that likes to blow things up or break things, um, they probably won't do much damage with the stuff that I wrote in there, but there's things like, uh, getting your own DNA, um, out of your cheeks, which is kind of neat. Um, and, uh, boy, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones I'd have, um, for some reason. Know. So when I did my 23 and me, um, testing for D news, we had to spit in a vial, right? So whenever you, when you just said, um, getting DNA out of your cheeks, all I can think of is a kid being like, look, mom, I found my DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, but I feel like I feel like this book for you is like such the best example of like nerdery gone right. Where like you've done all kinds of weird stuff, as we've discussed in your life of like the gaming and the music and the teaching and all of this. Um, but like to be able to write a book for people that's educational, which is a passion of yours, that's about the stuff that you love. Like that's so awesome. Yeah, I I feel really lucky to be able to do that. And, and I think about, you know, when I was a kid, like a, a book like this, um, I, I would have read from cover to cover and it, it would have been one of those things that I would be, you know, bugging my parents with all the time. Like, can I do this? Can we do this? Can I, you know, do this interesting thing? Uh, can I watch this TV show? Tell me more about this. I want to learn about space or dinosaurs. And it, it, science fiction now, I think, is is a lot more everything about being nerdy i think is a lot more mainstream yeah. but um there's still a lot of things that people just kind of take at face value in mm -hmm. science fiction so i think it's really valuable for kids to also see or anybody to see what the science is behind them um because science fiction and, and science fact they influence each other mm -hmm. um and it just it keeps going back and forth um and there was even a npr uh thing on the other day about how a lot of entrepreneurs are now starting to look at science fiction stories, even like classic science fiction to think about what's the next big thing. Like, I mean, five years ago, none of us would have thought of probably coming up with something like Uber, but now it's everywhere and, and people use it all over the world. But who, you know, coming up with an idea like that, you know, who, who could have come up with something like that? So science fiction is full of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, I mean, we're we're living in a, a sci-fi society at this point. Wow. Yeah, yeah. As a in my uh, 
career as a journalist, one of my favorite things to kind of throw in periodically were articles kind of showing how sci-fi is becoming sci-fact or, or Star Trek becoming reality, things like that, highlighting advances in technology and, and uh, you know, showing how they were portrayed on Star Trek or other shows and how we have that technology now. It's kind of awesome. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's really fun to see that um, and kind of highlighting it to people because, again, I think people are very casual observers and, you know, don't really pay much attention to to sci-fi or, or things going on. So kind of highlighting how it uh, influences or, or has become part of our daily lives is really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's... It, do, oh, go, go, ahead, go ahead, Amy. Oh, I was just going to say, and it makes, like, it, and what's so great about that is that it makes the science so accessible through yeah. science fiction. Like, yeah. even if you don't like science, you can see something in a movie that you, you put no effort into wanting to see beyond, like, eh, why not? Here's my, like, what, how much is a the movie these days? Like, 50 bucks? Like, I don't know. Movies are insane. I haven't seen a movie in a really long time. And I only go to a second-run theater, so it's $2. Um, but, yeah, somebody who just, like, sees something in a movie and is like, this is super cool. And then you can be like, well, did you know that they're actually developing this technology? And it just, like, gives people a reference point to actually understand what it is that that science is doing. Instead of like, it becomes less scary and way more exciting that way. And that's so fun to like, see that inspiration in people. I'd love to see something like that at the end of Star Wars, you know, during the crawl. Like, why not have like a little half screen thing that says like, you know, hey, here's some of the science behind some of the stuff that you saw. Like, you know, can we actually travel faster than light? Or, you know, can someone actually build a real lightsaber? I mean, there's all kinds of content like that. It would be great to see it you know, piggybacked on things like, you know, popular movies or TV shows. I think, um, uh, well, Amy, you might remember this because of The Martian, but wasn't there like a like a NASA um, trailer before the movie or something like that when it came out? Even It might have I, even been crowdfunded. I don't mm. know because I only saw the movie, this is like the worst way to say it, but I only saw the movie at the world premiere in Toronto because <laughs> I was covering it for NASA mm-hmm. TV. Um, and there was no, there was no preview, no nothing. Like the preamble was the director talking about it. And then they immediately went into it because it was everyone, you know, this Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, which is like this massive concert venue. Um, yeah. I in, don't our, know. in our media saturated world now and with social media and everything, it, it's both awesome and kind of annoying, but with movies now, like, uh, What's the one with Chris Pratt now that's out? Uh, and Boy, passengers? Passengers. Yeah. So like immediately. What's great is that I have seen the, the trailer for that and I still don't understand what the movie is possibly going to be about. Well, I haven't seen it either and people seem to hate it. But the one thing awesome. about that and we see Go with on. now all sci-fi movies or space related movies is almost immediately after it comes out, you'll get space writers you know, commenting or, or scientists or whatever, publishing uh, stories saying, how close did they come to, to actually getting the science right in this movie? So, yeah. And that's the one thing they've said about that movie is that they actually got the science right as far as they think. Yeah, that that's that's another sci-fi movie, though. I, I just, I don't think I'm going to see. It just doesn't look that good to me. And I, I read yeah. kind of a, I, I read a bit of a review about it that painted it as more of like a, like a sci-fi stalker film. <laughs> And what does that even mean? I, well, I don't if they turned it into a horror, then it would the be awesome. I would be all for that. But yeah, it just sounds awful. Yeah, it. I don't want to. I don't want to give it away to your to your listeners because yeah, don't spoil. I, I learned too much about the film. But yeah. all right. So I've got to ask you this: Have you ever been to any of the sci-fi dinner parties that ASU hosts? No. So they do this thing. High five dinner parties? Yeah. I don't know about these. So it's really cool, and I don't know how consistent they are with them. They do them periodically, and I'm on a a mailing list to get notified about them. But, um, yeah, like I went to one of the first ones they did. But they'll, like, choose a movie and have somebody who is, you know, somehow either involved with the movie or involved with whatever topic they want to talk about associated to that movie um, come, and they give, like, a sack dinner (laughs) with really bad food but you know they provide food and you sit there you eat and then you watch um whatever episode of star trek or uh, you know a movie or something and then they'll do like a, a lecture or discussion afterwards it's really cool i need so to do this i went the one i went to they did the the gorn episode 
from uh, Star oh. Trek. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know how they choose who they're going to have as their guests or how they tie in these topics, but uh, you know, they do kind of spread across sci-fi and make it very, very broad and interesting. But they do that, and I think they do it monthly. So I'll, I'll if I remember, I'll send you the link um, yeah, to their website because they have a website for it. And uh, yeah, it happens right on ASU's campus, and you know that's always fun going back there after so many years because it's completely transformed since I went there so many decades ago um <laughs> but the coolest thing now walking on that campus is seeing like the the model of uh the curiosity rover i haven't seen that they've got a, a life-size life-size replica of curiosity there it's pretty cool wow need to do this yeah you These should definitely cool go asu has neat stuff they do have neat stuff and i've got a friend my friend matt works in the physics department Hmm. Over there. I need to find him. Go do the things. No, They've I'll, done some stuff with their planetarium I'll be back. too, but um, yeah, they. I need to get on more lists and actually go and interact with peoples. <laughs> I know. Well, I, that's that's another thing too about like science and, and science fiction is uh, I know a lot of science centers and planetariums do um, like adult nights. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't heard of um, the Arizona Science Center doing anything like this. Yeah. Which I think would be fantastic. I mean, the last thing I saw that they're doing is a, another Metallica light show in, mm. the, um, in the planetarium, which is great. I mean, I'm not a huge Metallica person, but, you know, I, I hope that maybe they're doing stuff where they're involving the science and everything. It seems like it would be more appropriate if they did Queen or something that sort of had a tie in. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. oh, well. Little Flash Gordon would be wonderful. Well, see, it's going to take people like us, like going and being annoying <laughs> and saying, "Hey, yeah, you know what you need to do?" Doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. There's you no know the kind of people that, that every business hates. Hey, let me tell you but what you need to do. Somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what it takes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, like when we've talked yeah. about Amy doing doing a. Uh, you know, sky watches or things like that. Uh, you know, we should do that sometime. We'll do one in Phoenix, and we'll yeah. we'll publicize it and get some people to come yeah. out. And... That would be fun. That would be a lot. Of yeah, fun. we could definitely find a good event going on and do like a live show from there or something. Yeah. Totally well, do things. Yeah, the there's cool stuff happening. Eclipse this summer. Although that's not here. Yeah, but that's yeah. in like Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we need to. We, we, yeah. We'll find a. We'll find a distillery that wants to host a party. We'll get them to sponsor yes. it. I have a telescope. Got that covered. So we'll take the telescope. We'll go Perfect. and we'll get a bunch of whiskey. <laughs> we'll have a good time. This this can't possibly go wrong. No whiskey, telescope, and eclipse. What could possibly and a live stream? All the things you need. Yeah. Well, live what on could the internet. Possibly go yes. wrong. Uh, yeah. Whatever ha whatever goes wrong will be the right kind of wrong at that point. Yeah, yeah we'll go with that. Do do I get to um do I get to ask you guys questions too? Do I get to flip um that's never been done before. You're you're setting new new uh, ground here, but yeah. go for it. Cuz Jason, I know this is this is the first time we've met, but Amy's talked a lot about you and and um your passion for UFOs and things like that. And I'm I'm just curious, tell me more about the ufo stuff that you are into well we're definitely ufos are a big part of this show and we're going to talk about so many facets of ufos mm -hmm. over the course of this show but yes. you know i was in the unique position of being hired by and helping start a ufo company a for-profit ufo company solely focused on ufos and extraterrestrials like a full-fledged media company all about ufos so and i did that for, for more than six years so i was a full-time salaried ufo journalist investigator researcher um so you know i really went into it knowing not much at all about ufos other than you know growing up in the desert of arizona and seeing all sorts of strange things certainly being here in 97 for the phoenix lights seeing that um you know so i dove down the rabbit hole and and uh you know had to get up to speed pretty fast and you know you find out very quickly when you start doing the research that uh the whole ufo subject is a lot more complex than just 
UFOs, are they alien or are they not? Um, there, there's a lot, lot going on with the whole field of UFOs. So, you know, I was, I was totally enveloped in it for, for more than six years, and I'm still heavily involved in it, following it closely. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, interested in that subject quite deeply. Um, I've seen a lot of things that I can't explain, but at the same time, having been my focus for more than six years, you know, a great benefit that I have is that, you know, being involved in that, focusing on that, studying it, researching it, and having people contact you daily, you know, I've seen thousands upon thousands of photos and videos, um, both old and new, you know, pre-Photoshop, uh, film days, um, to modern stuff. And so I got pretty darn good at being able to identify things that are commonly misidentified. Um, wow. so I can, you know, seeing a photo or video, I have a pretty good idea of what the most likely explanation is for something that's in the sky day or night. But, you know, there are things that, uh, you know, seem to defy logic, defy physics, um, you know, bizarre things going on. And they've been investigated by uh, governments around the world and still are. So there's some fascinating things going on in the sky and being a lover of space, you know, and, and lover of the unknown in general, you know, that, that piques my curiosity and, you know, I approach it scientifically and journalistically, keeping an open mind and just trying to, you know, go after these things, chase them as far as I can and, and try to figure them out. Yeah. That sounds amazing. That's I can remember, too, like being in high school, like my early, my early couple years of college, um, I was really into UFOs. I think I even wrote my, my senior, my high school senior, um, uh, paper about UFOs oh, and, that's awesome. and things like that. And I, I grew up around, uh, people who had like some really wild UFO stories. Um, and I, as I got older, I, I became a lot more skeptical about it. Um, but there's still some stories like my, my, my mother, uh, had one completely insane story that she could never explain. Um, and I, I've never met anybody who actually could explain it either. So that's, I, I always love still reading about that kind of stuff and keeping up with it. Although it's never, I haven't been that involved as I was when I was younger. But, and that's one of the, one of my favorite yeah. things about the UFO subject is just finding out how absolutely everybody is curious or fascinated by or you know has some sort of personal experience with ufos you know when people find out that you're in the ufo field or you know you're somebody who not going to laugh at them if they talk about ufos they have a ufo story or they know somebody who has a ufo story it's pretty interesting yeah yeah and it's it's sometimes it's sad too when a, a lot of people will you know dismiss that kind of stuff out of hand but it's also a great tool to get people talking about things about science and critical right. thinking and mm -hmm. being objective. And, you know, whenever, whenever kids bring it up in, in my classes or science classes, it was always really fun because it would always start out with a great, you know, conversation where we'd end up either talking about, you know, things that you can prove and things that you can't. And, and what does that mean in terms of science and what does it mean in terms of um, somebody's, you know, decision to believe something based on that? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I always find that stuff fascinating. It's always a lot of fun and especially, especially getting young kids talking about things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Because you'll find it. I find out that, you know, some kids might really be into dinosaurs and not care about, um, you know, uh, space as much, but for whatever reason, aliens gets everybody talking. And you know what? A lot that. of, a lot of schools, mm -hmm. especially in the UK in the past, um, five to 10 years, I'm going to say, um, have really incorporated the extraterrestrial theme in a lot of their curriculum. And they'll uh, use it for, for writing assignments, creative writing and things like that. They'll go so far as to stage like UFO crashes on the school grounds and have the kids go out and they'll have like local police departments and stuff there. The kids will go out and they'll basically have to like conduct investigations or act as journalists, um, you know, find out what the details are, the evidence that was collected or whatever, just everything about the incident that happened and then write a story about it. 
Wow. But that's pretty Weird. common. Yeah. That just gave me a, a new idea for one of the chapters huh. I'm writing. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. That I, if I was a kid, I would have loved doing that. Yeah. Because as a science teacher, I mean, you can use that and all kinds of stuff. There's forensics, there's writing, right. uh, there's using scientific theory, you know. Uh, yeah, that would that would be fantastic. I want to well, and with this. the movie Arrival, mm. Arrival, I still haven't seen it, but, uh, you know, there's fantastic. a whole communication thing, too. I mean, that's uh, an amazing element, too. Um, it just really, there's so many things that you can use <clears throat> to really get kids thinking about you know, so many different areas mm -hmm. and not just kids too. I yeah. Mean, I was going to say it's, it's adults too. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it'll peak that curiosity and want make you want to learn a bit more. And it's just a great teachable moment for anybody. It's one of my favorite really. things. One of my favorite things too, um, in the UFO field is the, uh, I have several friends who focus on essentially UFO philosophy, just, you know, kind of thinking about questions like that, like, yeah. you know, communicating with extraterrestrials. So, and even in like the whole SETI field over years, I mean, it's in the eighties. I mean, that was, uh, most of it was a joke. There are hardly any, you know, uh, researchers that were taken seriously if that's yeah. what they wanted to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, but now with all these exoplanets showing up everywhere and, um, you know, people having access to every news article you can imagine constantly through Facebook and the internet and whatever, um, now it, it, it's a much more common thing. I mean, you know, you've got all kinds of different versions of SETI and everybody's doing different research and it's all, you know, becoming respectable now. That right. there's actually, people feel like there's something to look for. And as yeah. awesome as that is, it's so funny because in the UFO world, in the UFO community, um, SETI is largely regarded as not necessarily bad guys like the governments are bad government is bad guys but said he's frowned upon really and that's so baffling because you think here's mainstream science getting mainstream funding getting mainstream media coverage they're looking for intelligent extraterrestrial life what more could you possibly want but yeah. uh but no no said he is frowned upon and uh you know largely because people misunderstand what city what especially the the SETI institution does um you know, they focus on the listening for radio signals, and that's a very small part of what the SETI Institute does. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, a lot of uh, the Kepler data and what we, the, the, the exoplanets that have been discovered, a lot of the people at SETI Institute have played a large role in that. They do yeah. some awesome stuff. I'm a big SETI fan. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think a lot of people just look at SETI as like the weirdos who sit around trying to talk to aliens. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there are people in the UFO and community, historian. the reason they don't like them is because of yeah. that, that radio um, focus, because, you know, there are aliens obviously wouldn't be using radio waves, and that's a big criticism of SETI, mm -hmm. like, people think that. If there's this advanced civilization, they're not going to be using radio waves for communication. But SETI's also looking for laser-based communica laser communication. I mean, they're doing all sorts of things, so. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry, huh. that just had to go on my, my steady love round. That makes me unpopular. But No, nah, no, nah, do it, do it. I'm, um, I'm two thumbs up for all right. search for extraterrestrials. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I find it very interesting, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really like engaged in that part of the space world much, so I will. Well, and there's all sorts of interesting <laughs> things going on right now. I mean, from alien megastructures to you know, uh, fast radio burst, you know, lots of different mysterious mm -hmm. things going on that, you know, have been detected for years and, and scientists around the world have been focusing attention on specific things that have happened and still no consensus on uh, identifying sources for mysterious signals. So that stuff is always exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no matter what you believe or what you know, like it's awesome to realize that there's so many things that we can't explain. Like even if we'll eventually figure it out, it's like that unknowingness that's like really fun to just like. And it's on play such a with. grander scale too. I yeah. mean, we don't know. So like we, we hardly know verse, anything like, about our planet. Yeah. Like there's so many yeah. things here that we have yeah. no idea about. We don't know about this little planet yeah. of ours. And like every year, you read like, oh, scientists discover four thousand new species. You know, Wow, where did yeah. those come from? Yeah, how like, are we, we don't know anything that's in our ocean. Like it's crazy. So, yeah. like these mysteries in space are just like, like 
expanded yeah. exponentially. It's crazy. I love it. That's what's yeah. that's what's great about science because there's never yeah. going to be a shortage of things to to find things or look for. Discover. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. 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 It's so cool. Yeah. Science. It's awesome. Speaking of sh- shortage, how are you guys doing cool. on your beer? Um, I, well, I'm we got to ask you because you're the. <laughs> I've been trying I'm, to I'm... drink very fast, yeah. but uh, still got beer. Still have some. I mean, I've, I've at this point, I should say, like, I've cracked my second bottle, but I'm only here. So I'm not going to finish it, but I have finished my first one. I'll actually have to go to my refrigerator I'm, I... <laughs> to get mine, which is on the far end of my massive home that I live in. So <laughs> it might take me um, five seconds to do that at some point. We, 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 How could, much... we could wrap up the show. We don't have to finish my giant um, beer, guys. Sorry, I decided how, to drink how, a quart how... of beer, but... No, I like that you decided to drink a quart of beer. Um, I had to make up for my time. previous episodes where you always had a big beer and I was not playing the big beer I game. I really, I had a big beer in the fridge too. I think I have like Space Boy or Space Party beer, like very nice. appropriate beer, but I really want to try the Cinnamon Raisin Commodore Stout. Yeah, I don't blame um, you. Which is Sounds not great. as like cinnamony as I was expecting it to be. It's like a really just nice, easy drinking stout. Hmm. Yeah, I'm a fan. I like it. Can't complain about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm also just looking at the time. We, we're in an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Should we should we wrap it just for the sake of our listeners? <laughs> People are good. Why don't they shut up? <laughs> I know. I know. I love that we, um, I, again. I don't know, Matt. You were think. asking questions. Do you have any more questions you'd like to ask? Um, hmm. As Jason Where's tries Pete? to finish the massive beer. Pete. I don't know where Pete is. I think he's probably sleeping on the bed. Oh. Well, I'm glad he made an appearance. It's always a good he show did, when Pete makes an he appearance. He made a good appearance, too. He, he stared really right into the camera for a second there. So if you're listening to this, you should go and check out the video podcast because you'll look at Pete's face. Yes. I felt like I heard him purring at one point, too. Oh, so. that's you awesome. You might have. I was trying to get him to stop. Like, you know, he likes to rub his face on everything to mark it as his own. And I don't want him rubbing up against the mic while we're recording because he'll just hear like a... <laughs> so, yeah. But you might have heard him purring. Oh. Yeah. Well, let's let's wrap the show, Amy. I'm not going <laughs> to force people to wait around until I finish my beer. I've chugged as much as I, I just, can. But it's... All, all I can think of is um, because our first episode just went live, for those of you listening, um, and there were a few comments that were, you know, remarking on the fact that our first episode is an hour and 48 minutes long or something. <laughs> like, it's nearly two hours. And they're like, oh, I'm going to have to, like, settle in for this. I'm like, oh, I feel bad. Um, but I don't feel bad because, like, this is awesome and this has all been, like, really, really fun stuff to talk about. Um, so we should ask you, Matt. As we ask all of our guests, if you could go to anybody in the solar system, um, forget about things like how to stay alive and whether or not you can restrictions. Yeah. Yeah. All of those things. Uh, Forget about those. Where would you go and why? Well, okay. So this changes for me often. And I I think about this question a lot. Um, (laughs) I'm going to go with uh, Mimas, which is a moon of Saturn. And it would have an amazing view of Saturn. And it also happens to be the desktop background on my computer right now that I put on yesterday, nice. which is a Chesley Bonestell painting who I'm obsessed with mm-hmm. and would like to get some of his prints someday. So, yeah, today I would go to Mimas because I'd like a nice distant view of Saturn in the sky. And that's awesome. Very amazing. Very good is answer. It, just, yeah, we've never had, I mean, that's definitely an obscure moon that I don't think anybody knows exists. Um how far how far is it from Saturn relative to to the other moons? Is it one of the outer more the outer more larger moons? Uh you know what? I don't remember what order it is. It's it's not a it's not a ring grazing moon. Um but I don't think it's out quite as far as Titan is. I think it's a hmm. little bit closer. Um but I could be totally wrong and somebody will probably correct me in the comments below. Well, well you've put your I'm disclaimer out there. So happy with your answer, because it's so different <laughs> from anything we've had, and we, we yeah. like different, so that's great. Yeah, Woo-hoo. yeah, you're because you're like a proper space nerd person. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sitting next to my space duct tape, so <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, awesome. Matt, where can people go to follow you on the internet and creep creep on you <laughs> and creep on me and uh, um, find, follow what you're doing? I am on Twitter at. E-O-S-D-I-S. 
Uh, I'm on Instagram at Matthew Brendan Wood, but Brendan is spelled B-R-E-N-D-E-N. And uh, I will have a Facebook author page that I forgot to make live today. We'll, <laughs> we'll put but all your links fancy. in the description. Yeah, um, yeah no, no. By yeah. the time this episode goes up, we'll, yeah, we'll have it there. <laughs> we'll have all your stuff. And we'll also put links up for your, at least your first book. I don't know if your second, do you have a, do you know when your second book pub date is? Uh, I think it's November of this okay. year, but it okay. may so be we'll, pushed back because I'm right. Burned. Well, we'll put the link to the first book up and uh, yeah. People now know the second book exists, which is about the solar system, we should say. It's a, a tour of the planets. Um, yes. Again, for, for sort of 12 to 15-year-olds. Mm-hmm. Um, right? Yeah. That's it. All right. Awesome. Um, Jason, where can we find more of you? Uh, Twitter is the best. I am at Acentric, A-C-E-C-E-N-T-R-I-C, also acentric.com. And you can always find... Me and uh, this show and other content at RoguePlanet.tv. All right. And if you want to follow my daily activities, which vary from space to very much non-space, AST Vintage Space, vintage like 1950s, space like what's up there, um, on Twitter, also on Instagram. Um, my blog, my uh, If you want to know more, like, super nerd space stuff from me vintage space is my main youtube channel and if you are watching this on youtube you will find all of those links um and if you are listening to the podcast and you want to see the video podcast uh the channel is just amy sure title number two yes youtube.com amy sure title two that's because right. amy sure title apparently i years ago made it direct to that's not surprising space. i'm really sad about that but in retrospect it was probably the right move at the time yeah. <laughs> so yeah so yeah in um, case you didn't know the show is available in both video and audio format you can find the audio on itunes and stitcher and really everywhere else so that will be your audio version but you really should watch the video version i highly encourage it it's fun Sometimes we do things. <laughs> it's entertaining. Um, all right. So I guess with that, um, thank you, everybody, for listening to yet another episode. Um, as always, be sure to leave us any ideas for beers you'd like us to drink Please. or people you would like us to talk to or topics you'd like us to take on. Um, anything like that in the comment section below on YouTube or um, I'm not totally sure where to leave them as comments on the audio versions, but you can also, of course, tweet at us. And um, yeah, we will keep... Uh, we'll keep drinking and talking space and nerdery and music at you guys so thank you so much for joining us bye cheers